gentlemen. And now he's thrusting deeper and deeper inside. It feels electric, as if his whole body has become sexually charged, priapic, engorged, blissful. Bring me your gift, he mutters, no longer knowing what he's saying. Your one true gift and make me always this, always so I, I pray, I... And then the pleasure of crests and orgasm blasting his mind into void. <laughs> His head and self, an entire beingness, a perfect blank, as he thrusts deeper into her and deeper still. Eyes closing, spasming, he luxuriates in the moment, and then he feels a lurch, and it seems to him that he's hanging, head down, although the pleasure continues. He opens his eyes. He thinks, grasping for thought and reason again at birth, and wonders without fear in a moment of perfect postcoital clarity whether what he sees is some kind of illusion. This is what he sees. He is inside her to the chest. And as he stares at this, in disbelief and wonder, she rests both hands upon his shoulders and puts gentle pressure on his body. He slip slides further inside her. How are you doing this to me? He asks, or he thinks he asks, but perhaps it's only in his head. You're doing it, honey, she whispers. He feels the lips of her vulva tight around his upper chest and back, constricting and enveloping him. He wonders what this would look like to somebody watching them. He wonders why he's not scared. And then he knows. I worship you with my body, he whispers, as she pushes him inside her. Her labia pulls slickly across his face, and his eyes slip into darkness. <laughs> She stretches on the bed like a huge cat, and then she yawns. Yes. She says. You do. The Nokia phone plays a high electrical transposition of the ode to joy. She picks it up and thumbs a key and puts the telephone to her ear. Her belly is flat, her labia small and closed. A sheen of sweat glistens on her forehead and on her upper lip. Yeah. She says. And then she says, No, honey, he's not here. He's gone away. She turns the telephone off before she flops out on the bed in the dark red room. And she stretches once more, and she closes her eyes, and she sleeps. So we have a special round of applause for Zola. You know, I, I, I was, I, I rather liked it, I thought, you know, there is pattern. Giving 1,500 people an experience they will not forget. <laughs> yeah, this will be, this will be a lot of therapy sessions tomorrow. <laughs> I had a breakthrough last night I didn't want to have. Uh, can we have two hours today, maybe? Uh, I, the, it, it's, I, I don't want to do, ask one of those douchey questions like, is, how much of you is in the character and blah, 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 but, <laughs> it, it did really hit me that, you know, Shadow, a lot of heroes in books are the reluctant hero. They hear the call and they're very like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. Not only is he a reluctant hero, but he's openly kind of scornful and angry at these, this whole other world of gods that's kind of calling him into service. And I'm just, again, not without trying to get all psychoanalytical and James Lipton on you, how... <laughs> What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> no, um, what, how, how much of that is kind of your, I mean, did you experience something like that in that you, you did kind of feel the call of this whole other world and were you reluctant or were you kind of pissed off? Not, not, I don't want to use the word pissed off, but like, is this the story that's happening? And, because we, the way you describe it coming together, it came together in these weird bits and pieces and you almost like, is this the story I'm going to write? That's a, yeah, so there was, there was like, definitely some of that. I, I mean, the, it, 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 to, 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 to deconstruct your question in a form that allows it actually to be answered by a human being. <laughs> no, Shadow isn't me. Shadow is, was incredibly... Shadow's the, 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 the 
the most frustrating character I've ever written. Um, absolutely without question. I, I, I remember the first draft of American Girls, the first draft, draft of chapter one, I tried writing in the first person. I thought, well, wouldn't it be great? And, I, and I'll have him tell the story. And here is a character who actually doesn't like talking very much. He doesn't really like telling you things, and he really has no desire to tell you what he thought about anything. And it was just astoundingly, absolutely, and entirely um, frustrating for this poor author. And so next time round, I took it, and I, I put it into the third person, and um, I, you know, most characters give you something. And, and even Shadow, by the time I got to do the story about him in Fragile Things, the monarch of the Glen, he, he, he was a lot more, he warmed up, he'd come back to life. But, you know, you had somebody who was fairly shadowy to begin with, and then undergoes enormous, he's, he's sort of just living inside himself while he's in prison. And then his wife does. And he just closes down pretty much completely. He's going through, he's, he's going through the motions. Um, and it did not make an easy character to write, because he didn't really get angry. He, he just goes through it, he experiences it. And he didn't want anything. And the best thing about characters, if you're an author, is just you figure out what they want. And then you stop them getting it, or you give them some of it, or you give, them the, give it to them and you take it away from them, or whatever, and, and you have a story. That's, that's most of, you know, there's a point, I think, in, in Sandman, where Desire is talking about dream, and, and Desire says that's, you know, the plot of all of your stupid stories, somebody wants something. Except, I had to write American Gods, and he didn't want anything. And it's not a good thing for an author. It's, it's, it's like some kind of horrible zen exercise. In, um, you know, which is one reason why, why American Gods, most of my books people either like or they don't feel very strongly about. And I'm fine on that, except for American Gods, which people either really like or they hate. You know, they don't sort of, I mean, yeah, I read it, it's okay. It's a like, oh, stupid book, I hate it. And, and it's people who like other stuff I've done quite a lot of the time. Um, and I think a lot of that is, when I talk to them, it's they got frustrated with him. They wanted him to be a proper active hero, and he's not. Well, do you remember a particularly profoundly negative assessment of the book, or, in, or a profoundly negative reaction from somebody, or, or either writing about it or talking to you about it, that, that actually made you almost maybe... I, I'm not going to... Do you remember something like that, like, like a moment that really... You know, you, you don't really... After you've been writing for a while, you stop reading reviews and you start counting reviews. Um, in the sense of... You read the first reviews. Like my, and, and I learned not to listen to reviews right in the beginning. I did a book called Violent Cases. Long time ago, with Dave McKean, it was my first book. And um, it was our first book, and we were very, very nervous. We brought it out, we wanted to see what the reviews were going to say. And we got a review in, in um, Comics Advertiser or something like that. And so we read it, and it said that it was quite good, but it was overpriced. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave and I were young. And we believed reviews were a really important thing. And he was a reviewer. And he was saying our book was overpriced. We went to the publisher. And we said, our book is overpriced. <laughs> our publisher said, OK. <laughs> and we said, we'd like you to take the price of our book down. <laughs> the publisher said, OK, but you're just cutting your royalty. And we said, we, we read a review. We believe in reviews. We're up with reviews. And we don't mind. Okay. So the next edition of the book came down in price from £4.95 to £3.95. And we waited for people to say, Whoa, oh, good job, guys. <laughs> and nobody noticed. 
Nobody noticed at all. Nobody ever mentioned it. Nobody seemed to have noticed that, that it had come down in price. It stayed down in price for a year or two, and then we went back to the publisher and we said, yeah, you can put it back up if you want. <laughs> and they did. And that really was the last time I listened to a review. <laughs> After that, you count them. The first reviews of American Gods, I actually remember because I was still sort of, you read the first few, and the first review of American Gods that came in said that it was a really good book and a great sort of road trip, except for the stuff where Shadow goes to the town of Lakeside in Wisconsin when the book comes to a crashing halt. And then there was another, the next review came in, and it said that the, the road trip stuff was pretty incoherent, but the power of the book came from the scenes where Shadow visits the town of Lakeside, <laughs> where Gaiman conjures up small town America in a way that you can believe. And I went, okay, well, there's my two reviews. And, <laughs> and after that, it's much more a matter of going, no, oh, good review, good review, good review, bad review, good review, good review, bad review, review, good review. And you kind of count them. You, you just sort of, you, you have a rough idea of what people are saying, but it doesn't really do very much. Now, are you going to, I mean, now that this is being adapted in, to a TV show and, and books like Walking Dead and you know, Game of Thrones are, are being, I mean, are you going to have, a, obviously, a hand at the adaptation? Is there stuff that you're worried that you may have to leave out or stuff you want to make sure gets in? Or, like, how does that... Oh, I want to make sure gets in. I'm very, I, it's weird, the things that I'm concerned about, I, I really want to make sure that the races of all of the characters are right. Finding, um, I, I don't like it when black characters become white on movies, when things like that. Uh, uh, it, was, it was something I found deeply problematic there was an attempt at one point by some people who had a lot of money and a lot of clout to let me let them uh, get the rights to a Nancy Boys. And then somewhere in there, they made the fatal mistake of saying to me, and of course, the characters won't be black in the movie because black people don't like fantasy. And it was like, and they were suddenly very surprised by the fact that we were no longer interested in selling them the book. <laughs> yeah. um, Thank you, but it's not, it's not necessary. It wasn't exactly a moral. <laughs> if you made the black characters magical and they helped white people play golf better, white people would love that. If you ever consider that, that would have been a blockbuster. So I want to keep the racial, racial mix of American Gods much the same, and I want to make it, I want to make it faithful, but also would like it to have a few surprises for people who read the books. I, I, I hate that thing where people read the books and they go, oh, I know everything that's going to happen. It's like, I can't go and go, no, you don't. <laughs> you know a lot more than anyone who has not read the book does, but there may still be some surprises for me. You were mentioning the, the internet earlier and how, you know, no one just makes a TV show anymore. There is a website, there's all kinds of interactive stuff. It would seem to me that this book would be perfect for that, for not only do you get the, the TV show every week, whatever it is, but then the supplementary stuff, either on the internet or through other sources, would just be amazing. That, that could almost be a whole other freestanding thing going on. That would, you know what I mean? Like you, yeah, and, and there's also the stuff that I, I, I remember, one, one thing that I get from a lot of people on American Gods is people saying that they would love some kind of glossary, some kind of index, a list of all the gods and who they are so people can look them up. And I, it's one of those things that I, I thought about doing when I published the book the first time around and then came down against and thought about a little bit with this version and then came down against. And there is at least one website where somebody's done and for, I mean, a very good sort of first stab <coughs> at listing everybody. Um, but that's the kind of thing that it would be really fun to do, to just, just, just actually give people background on these characters and where they come from. Although, the, the, the one argument against that is, it is fun to experience it, the journey with Shadow as he begins to realize, who, like, part of the fun is, the, oh, wait a minute, this is, oh, that's who I'm talking to, like, that's, 
that a lot of the big shocks come from those moments. Sure, but there are also places where, you know, I'll talk to people about characters in the book, and they'll say, well, why aren't there any, why aren't there any Greek characters in the Greek, Greek Roman gods? <laughs> and I'll say, well, actually, there are a few. And they'll say, why? Well, I'll say, well, for example, the Gorgon that he went to see, and people will go, what Gorgon? Do you remember? And then I go, well, no, I didn't really make it. Ah, well, she had mice in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> they were obviously there to feed her hair, but I, I, maybe I should have made it more clear. You know, that's, yeah. that's, uh, I thought, actually, the, I thought that's, the white bike messenger with dreadlocks was the Gorgon, so I'm totally confused. <laughs> one, of, one, of the, one of the things that I would probably do now, uh, when you're writing a book, if you're me, um, <laughs> You, you set up weird rules for yourselves. And one of the weird rules when I was writing American Gods was very definitely that um, I had to be able to convince myself in some way by whatever pieces of information I could find, even if they were completely barking mad and woo woo, but as long as there was something I could hold on to that maybe at some point these characters had visited America. So, for example, with, with um, the Egyptians coming over in, in Cairo, the Egyptian gods, there's just a few wonderful barking mad things out on the fringes of archaeology where there's some copper stuff that they found in tombs that they, some people claim has been fingerprinted to copper mines in the Upper Peninsula and Northern Wisconsin. Well, that's Beautiful. That, that lets me go, maybe there was trade, maybe if there was trade, maybe somebody came over and, yeah, that kind of thing. But I never had anything with the Greco-Roman gods. However, the magic of the internet means that I have now read a glorious article about ancient Roman coins found in the mud of the Ohio River. <laughs> and while it is probably more likely than not, that at some point in the 19th century, a coin collector may have buried them there and left them there. Maybe he didn't. <laughs> Maybe the reason there, are, there were coins, Greek or Roman coins found deep in the mud of the Ohio River is because maybe there were some Greek or Romans there. So, so that allows me, within this weird set of rules that I've made for myself, to say, okay, I can have those guys. They can actually come. What was, what was a part of the book or a moment?